Columbo. It's one of the best loved detective series of all time. It's the show that made trench coats take the American fashion scene by storm. Well, maybe that's not true, but it did make Peter Falk a household name. And today, nearly 52 years after the series first season debuted back in 1971, I'm going to go through every episode from that first season and give it my definitive ranking. And we're going to do that right after this. Okay, when examining an episode of Columbo, I've decided to look at five key elements. First up is the killer. Who plays him, or her, and how well did they do it? How villainous were they? How do they play off the titular Columbo? This will be a combination of the performance and how the character was written. Basically, what my overall impression of them was. Next is the guest cast. This season is brimming with not only celebrity murderers, but also special guest stars playing the other suspects, grieving family members or witnesses. This might be the most biased category for me, as it depends on how well I like the guest stars and if I think they were utilized properly. Next up is the murder and or disposing of the body scene. How well plotted or inventive was the crime? How did it play out? And how is all of this staged, shot, and edited? All important points when looking at an unsolvable crime. Unsolvable except for our favorite detective, that is. We'll also look at the scene where Columbo finally catches the killer and reveals what key bit of evidence led to their downfall. How satisfying was it? And would it convincingly lead to a conviction? That's a tough one for this show. And last, but certainly not least, we'll examine Peter Falk and his performance in the episode. How well does he play the world's greatest police lieutenant? And were there any specific differences to his portrayal in that episode in comparison to the others? Each of these five categories will be graded out of five, with the episode as a whole receiving a final score out of 25, and at the end, I'll put them in order from worst to best of the season. Just a note, Prescription Murder will not be included in this list. I have a separate review of that one, and as it aired in 1968, I have decided to start my ranking with the pilot that aired three years later. Warning, full spoilers will follow. Let's go! The first episode to air in 1971 was Ransom for a Dead Man, directed by Richard Irving. Lee Grant stars as a woman who murders her husband, then stages a fake kidnapping and ransom drop to divert suspicions elsewhere. I think she's quite good, although does a rather terrible job of acting like a distraught widow. That's something that crops up a lot in this show. When someone has murdered their spouse or a friend, they don't seem to try terribly hard to be convincing when it comes to looking like someone dealing with grief. She's playing a very skilled lawyer and plays off Columbo pretty well, but is overall just very cold which is fine, but it results in her not being a very memorable villain. She's not bad by any means, but more so just a standard killer for this show. So I'll give Lee Grant 3 out of 5. The guest cast features Patricia Maddock as Lee Grant's stepdaughter, a girl with no love for her stepmother, but finds a supporter in Lieutenant Columbo, until she tries to plant some evidence, that is. Harold Gould plays the FBI agent originally in charge of the case, who butts heads with Columbo, and for the first time, we meet Bert, as played by Timothy Carey, the proprietor of the restaurant where Columbo gets his daily fix of chili. He and Peter Falk have an easygoing chemistry, and we'll be seeing him later in the season. Everyone is good, but since there aren't any huge, showy side characters, the guest cast gets 3 out of 5 as well. The murder scene this time, in contrast to Prescription Murder, is very sudden, without a lot of build-up. Lee Grant just blasts her husband as he walks into their living room. Where things get more complicated, though, is in the aftermath. As the fake ransom call comes in, and Lee Grant's hobby of being a pilot comes into play, I like the change of getting the murder out of the way very suddenly, and focusing on how she covers it up. I have questions, though. Why was there no blood on the floor? That can probably be answered by this simply being a more sanitized TV show from the early 70s, but how is she so certain that the bullet wouldn't go through him and embed itself in the wall? The ransom drop plan, too. It felt a little shoehorned to have to fit in her flying skills. Those flying scenes aren't particularly well shot, and we get more later on as well. While I like the idea of the plan, there are some loose threads that I couldn't help thinking of during the episode. 3 out of 5. The final scene I really liked, and comes down to something of a moral trap that Columbo lays for her. She pays off her stepdaughter to forget about the murder and keep quiet. The stepdaughter hands off the money, which came from the supposedly missing ransom, to Columbo, who promptly throws it back in Lee Grant's face. I enjoyed that he's betting on her not having a conscience, 
and believing a girl could forget about her father's murder. Would it get a conviction? There would likely be fingerprints on the cash from her, so I'm going to say it's a strong possibility. Four out of five. And now we come to Peter Falk. He was continuing to hone the character and looks much more disheveled already. The way he puts Harold Gould's FBI agent in his place is excellent, and he was beginning to put into practice Columbo's penchant for just silently wandering through a situation until somebody asks what he's doing there, as he does at the mansion early in the episode. We learn that he either has a fear of heights or flying or maybe both. I like these little quirks that are sprinkled in, but the scenes where he's up in the plane with Lee Grant just feel like padding to hit that hour and a half length to justify a TV movie. They don't further the plot and are instead just an attempt at humor that mostly fell flat for me. I mostly blame the script and editing for dragging those scenes out. As I said earlier, we also discover his love of chili and talking through a case whilst eating it. Peter Falk gets 5 out of 5. The first regular episode of the series was Murder by the Book, directed by none other than Steven Spielberg. The murderer this time was Jack Cassidy, and he was fantastic as one half of a mystery writing team who kills his writing partner after he has decided to go solo and break up their lucrative partnership. Jack Cassidy is admittedly less subtle than either Lee Grant or Gene Barry and looks guilty from the word go. But that isn't the important part. It's finding a way to catch him. He's very well cast as this playboy type who has given up on the actual business of writing years ago and now lives as a celebrity while his partner does the work. The way in which he romances a starstruck fan who may or may not be a witness to his crime is ruthless and so well played, Jack Cassidy gets 5 out of 5. Martin Milner stars as the writing partner who is killed, and also is great casting for this small role. He's very good-natured, holds no hard feelings against his lazy partner, and expects nothing until the moment he's gunned down while sitting on a couch. Rosemary Forsyth plays his wife, and while it's not a fantastic character, she does bring out some excellent moments with Columbo, as he makes her an omelette in her own kitchen and comforts her throughout the episode. Barbara Colby plays the lonely woman with a serious case of hero worship for Jack Cassidy. She is a very interesting character, pining away after this star author, but also cunning enough to blackmail him into paying her off and starting a relationship with her. This cast of characters gets 4 out of 5. The murder and the entire opening is amazing. First off, you get those opening scenes where the score is dominated by the pounding keys of a typewriter, and we follow Jack Cassidy as he parks his car and makes his way upstairs to meet his partner. I love the low angle shot as he's exiting the car, and the fake out where he greets Martin Milner with a gun pointed in his face, and then the real murder, shooting Milner on a plastic lined couch while he's in the middle of talking to his wife on the phone. It's brutal and cold, and demonstrates the kind of man this is so perfectly. And we get a second murder filmed with a startling POV shot. Both of them. Five out of five. The final scene is where this one falters for me. While I like the idea of Columbo rummaging through an entire office until finding a scrap of paper with this very murder plot outlined on it, I'm not sure it's enough to guarantee a conviction. That's a bit too far of a reach for me, but Columbo saves the scene when he tells him that the first murder plan was perfect and had to have been planned by someone else. But the second murder, the sloppy one, that was Cassidy's. Just based on that line, I'm giving the scene 3 out of 5. Peter Falk is, again, wonderful in the role. The way he's written is quite consistent, always finding some strange detail almost instantly, in this case pointing out the fact that Cassidy opened his mail after calling the police, and the fact that he drove home rather than flying. As I mentioned, his compassionate handling of the Widow character is a very nice, fleshing out of that side of Columbo, and he plays off Jack Cassidy so well. They make splendid enemies for one another. Five out of five. Next up is Death Lends a Hand, directed by Bernard Kowalski. Robert Culp makes quite an impression as a private investigator who tries to blackmail the wife of a client, and ends up killing her accidentally when she refuses. As I've been getting into Columbo, I've learned that Robert Culp is one of those VIP guest stars who made multiple appearances in the show, and in this first episode he stars in, he's excellent. His character is this extremely professional, ambidextrous PI, but with a temper that's on a hair trigger. He plays off Columbo quite nicely, even offering him a job at one point as a way of getting him off the case. Which reminds me, this character is doing double duty, trying to stay off the list of suspects while also investigating the murder himself at the behest of his client, who is, oh, by the way, 
Robert Culp gets 4 out of 5, but his client is played by the great Ray Milland. I thought he did a really good job. Just a quick sidebar. Ray Milland is a classic era Hollywood actor that I really enjoy. He was not only a great actor as either a suave leading man in comedies or film noirs or westerns, but also a very skilled director. As an extra recommendation, his directorial debut was a western from 1955 entitled A Man Alone, in which he also starred. Check it out. His character here, though, is a media tycoon, but one that is devoted to his much younger wife. He is given the, even at this point, standard trait of doubting Columbo's abilities and hires Robert Culp to make sure the investigation progresses smoothly. Oh, if he only knew. Watching him and Peter Falk together is a lot of fun, and my only problem is that he's not in the episode enough. Four out of five. The murder scene is superb, with the argument between the P.I. and the wife escalating until he knocks her down and she cracks her head on a coffee table. What follows is genius, having the scenes of him disposing of the body play out in the lenses of P.I. Brimmer's glasses, all in a tight close-up on his face. Five out of five. The final scene is, again, where I've got problems. The key clue is supposedly that one of the dead woman's contact lenses fell out during the struggle. While that does lead to a tense scene of Brimmer combing through the shag carpet at his house, which I really enjoyed, it results in him searching the trunk of his car and finding a contact lens. But surprise, she wasn't missing a contact lens at all, as the completely unnecessary exhumation of her body proved. So how exactly did the contact get there? Coincidence, Columbo tells us. So I wonder, did Columbo plant that lens in the trunk? It's kind of clever, but it just didn't work for me. I did enjoy, however, the last moment when Ray Milland is tempted to check for a potato stuffed in the exhaust pipe of that same car, but avoids it and strolls away. Since there is that, I'll go two out of five. And Peter Falk, no complaints whatsoever. His annoying questions and supposed belief in palm reading do drive Ray Milland and Robert Culp together, which isn't great for the plot, but of course it all turns out in the end, five out of five. And now we come to Dead Weight directed by Jack Smite. Eddie Albert is the culprit this time around, playing the retired General Hollister, a war hero known for his pearl-handled Colt revolver. Obviously, this is a take on General Patton with his famous ivory-handled pistols, but General Hollister has killed a military officer who has knowledge of some shady business practices, and did it in plain view of a witness and a little boat not far from his Oceanside house. I like Eddie Albert, normally, but I just found him miscast in this one. The retired military man, that works. But later on, he's supposed to romance the eyewitness, who we'll get to, and she is enthralled by him. Incidentally, that's a very similar plot device to what we saw in Murder by the Book, but I just don't see Eddie Albert as a dashing romantic figure. And while I enjoyed his being antagonized by Columbo, I just didn't care for his character. As his own famous series theme song states, Green Acres is the place to be but maybe guest starring on Columbo just isn't. Two out of five. Suzanne Plachette plays the star witness who initially reports what she saw, but slowly backtracks as she falls for this breathtakingly handsome general. <clears throat> I found her character just inconsistently written, feeling far too easily swayed. Suzanne Plachette does better when playing more headstrong characters, like in The Birds, for one example. And here she's saddled with a character that feels dumb, which isn't her fault. The mother character, too, played by Kate Reed, I just found irritating, and I wasn't sure why she was pushing her daughter into the arms of this suspected murderer. But we get an appearance from the chili-serving Bert, leading Columbo to a revelation. His presence definitely helps, but not enough to bring the guest cast a higher score than 2 out of 5. The murder also disappointed me, being a very simple shooting at the end of a conversation between the two men. But I did enjoy the reveal of the dead body hidden behind the wall and then taken out to be buried at sea. It's overall just quite a standard murder for the show and results in another 2 out of 5. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. Well, actually I do, but whatever. The solution to this one is what I liked, and it finally felt like something that would definitely land this killer in jail. That being the famous pearl-handled gun now on display in a museum being revealed to be the murder weapon. Columbo has gotten the gun tested, and it did indeed fire the fatal shot. I enjoyed the idea of having so much hubris to use an iconic weapon to commit murder and then put it on display for the public to view. I'll go three out of five. Peter Falk reveals to us that Lieutenant Columbo does not enjoy sea travel, 
adding to the list of things that he tries to avoid. In contrast to the flying scenes from Ransom for a Dead Man, I really liked his interrogation of General Hollister while fighting off seasickness, and the moment when he's waiting on the dock to again question the heroic general as his boat comes in was great. Seeing the anger rise in these suspects is somewhat anxiety-inducing, because Columbo just keeps pushing, but it's so much fun to watch. Five out of five. Suitable for Framing is up next, directed by Hi Averman. Ross Martin plays an art critic who murders his uncle, and he is exceptional in the role. He is so pompous and obnoxious. Take, for example, the scene where he's mingling at an art show, surrounded by women, telling a series of snooty jokes and arrogant stories. He's perfect. The best killers in this show are the ones who believe that they're above it all, and Ross Martin nails the part. Everything goes pretty smoothly for him until he attempts to frame his aunt for the murder, and Columbo simply won't bite. His desperation at trying to convince Columbo that she is definitely not a suspect, but you should investigate her anyway to find the evidence I planted is so entertaining. Five out of five. The guest cast is headlined first off by Don Amici, a huge 20th Century Fox star from the 30s and 40s. What's so interesting is how small the role is. I kept expecting there to be some twist with his character as the family lawyer. But there isn't. It's just a small role that somehow ended up being played by a very famous actor. And he's great! He doesn't try to steal the scenes, he's just transitioned into a dependable character actor, and I love that. Kim Hunter plays the aunt, divorced from her husband but still living close by, and she was a lot of fun. Rosanna Huffman plays the young art student accomplice to Ross Martin, and Vic Tabak shows up as a sort of hippie-ish painter. I'm giving the guest cast 4 out of 5, and the only reason I deduct a point is for not including a smidge more Don Amici. Otherwise, stellar all around. The murder this time is amazing. Ross Martin shoots his uncle while playing the piano. Simple enough. But what follows is so intricate and well plotted, he puts an electric blanket over the body of his uncle to throw off the time of death. He removes paintings from their frames, giving the illusion of a massive attempted art heist. His accomplice takes off with only two pastels, perfectly timed for the security guard to witness it. It's all presented so perfectly, and we figure out how well thought out it is as we're witnessing it. And throw in those extreme close-ups on various works of art while it plays out, and you've got a scene that easily deserves 5 out of 5. The closing moments are a thing of beauty, and bowled me over with how perfect an ending it is. Things are looking bad for dear old Aunt Edna. The murder weapon was found not far from her house. The wrapping paper where the Degas pastels made their exit in is found in her trash, and the pastels themselves are found in her house. Things look bad indeed, until the police start dusting for prints, Columbo's prints, placed on them in a seemingly overeager moment of curiosity earlier in the episode. Ross Martin immediately decries this. He could have touched them just now, he says. And then Columbo removes his hands from his trench coat pockets to reveal the gloves he's been wearing the entire time, and we cut to credits. The look of horror on Ross Martin's face as he realizes the jig is up is priceless. But for the purposes of this review, I'm pricing it at 5 out of 5. I've gone on quite a while about this episode already, but I loved Columbo's astute art observations during his introductory scene. And I loved the moment he's apparently napping in an armchair in Ross Martin's house and wakes up to apologize profusely. The writing in this episode is wonderful, and Peter Falk nails the part again, which leads me to another 5 out of 5. Lady in Waiting is our next episode, directed by Norman Lloyd. Susan Clark is our murderess this time, playing a woman who has been under the thumb of her brother for far too long and removes that thumb by killing him. This places her at the head of the family company until Columbo shows up, that is. Susan Clark I know best from the Apple Dumpling Gang, and she's pretty good in the role. I really like the idea of this character and how unaware she seems to be of coming off as guilty after her brother's death. She basically flaunts this new, unbridled version of herself, reinventing her wardrobe, hairstyle, etc., and commanding attention at the company board meeting. The other killers we've seen up to now all try to continue life as normal, but she decidedly does not. So the character is good, but there's something a little unspectacular about the performance. It's not dull by any means, but just felt a little lacking, so I'll go three out of five. The guest stars include Leslie Nielsen, in a serious role. Surely you can't be serious. Yes, I really am. I feel like there's a joke in there somewhere. He plays the boyfriend to Susan Clark, and he's quite good. He gets a moment not unlike Gene Barry's scenes in Prescription Murder, sitting with Columbo and explaining to him that he's figured out Columbo's tricks of the trade, 
and Columbo plays dumb the whole time. The murdered brother is played by Richard Anderson, who I actually met once in Los Angeles. He isn't on screen for very long before meeting his end, so it doesn't make a huge impression. I'm thinking three out of five for mostly being standard guest characters. The murder itself is very interesting, because it goes wrong, all undone by a spare key that Susan Clark was unaware of. She still commits the murder, and then has to simulate the events that she hoped would have occurred naturally. I like all the setup that we see, removing the light bulb, sitting patiently in her bed with a revolver close at hand, and the killing happening in this dreamlike way, showing us the events as though through Susan Clark's eyes, fuzzy and unclear because of the sleeping pill that she took. Four out of five. The scene where Columbo finally confronts her isn't very tricky. The whole time after Leslie Nielsen arrives, moments before the murder, it's in the back of your mind that he heard the gunshot and then the alarm being triggered, not the other way around, which would back up Susan Clark's story about mistaking her brother for a burglar. So when Columbo tells her that Leslie Nielsen remembers hearing those events in the wrong order, it's not a big shock, but it is a convincing reason to arrest her. And that final moment when he walks outside to light his cigar is classic. The only way he escaped being shot by her was telling her the police were just outside. But as the camera zooms out, we see an empty courtyard. No police in sight. But I'll tell you what is in sight. Another four out of five. Peter Falk plays Columbo in a little more of a gruff manner this time, early on. He's not quite as patient and down-home friendly as he normally is, but that does shift later into more typical Columbo mode. And typical Columbo mode gets five out of five around here. I love the guy. Short Fuse was the second last episode of the season and was directed by Edward M. Abrams. Try and say that three times fast. Oh boy. Here we go. Our murderer this time is played by Roddy McDowell. And that is the biggest problem, for me, about this whole episode. I don't like Roddy McDowell as an actor. I know nothing about him personally, so what I'm going to say is strictly about his acting style. I find him unconvincing in just about everything. I think he's often quite irritating and just not interesting on screen, and I found the same here. He's playing a free-spirited young man who wants to gain control of the business that his father started, so he kills his uncle, the current CEO, to do that. His look is just so entirely 70s-ish, which I shouldn't complain about in a series from the period, but it just adds to my non-enjoyment whenever he's on screen. His haircut, his loud patterned shirts, you know what I'm talking about. I just thought he wasn't compelling and is a wet blanket even in scenes featuring Peter Falk. Poor Roddy McDowell gets one out of five. The guest stars as well just infuriated me, and I'll explain why. It's not James Gregory as the wealthy uncle who gets murdered. I've seen him play loud, rich guys before, and he's perfectly serviceable. And William Wyndham, making already his second appearance in Columbo, is good as the likely heir to the throne after James Gregory dies. But Anne Francis is stuck playing the love interest to Roddy McDowell, I don't see that couple ever getting together because he's so immature and not pleasant to be around, even in the scenes that they share. They try to explain that away to some degree by her trying to keep the relationship secret at work, and I don't blame her. But the episode's biggest missed opportunity is with Ida Lupino. She was a massively talented actress and director, and she's wasted in this little role playing the far too gullible aunt of Roddy McDowell. I get that's the way she's written, trying to support her nephew at all costs, but I just don't understand sticking her in a thankless role like this. Plenty of talented actors here, but the script lets them down. Two out of five. The murder is somewhat interesting, featuring an explosive rigged cigar box that Roddy McDowell has put together, but the circumstances in which it's used are less so. It depends on his uncle needing to smoke a cigar while riding the back of his limo, and that he doesn't just have a spare one in his shirt pocket or jacket pocket. Yes, the cigar case in his overcoat has been taken care of, and the ones in the glove compartment, but then we also have the answering machine message in which he is calling his wife, but then makes sure to narrate for the audience the search for a cigar in the limo with the help of his driver, and all that just to extend the message length so Roddy McDowell can be counting down the seconds on his watch. It just felt a little bit sloppy in comparison to some of the others we've seen, so I'm giving this crime 2 out of 5. The scene where Columbo confirms Roddy McDowell's guilt is good, in theory, except for the parts where Roddy McDowell is in it. I like Columbo trapping himself, the killer and William Wyndham's character in a cable car slowly making its way up a mountain and opening up the explosive cigar box which the killer believes is the one he built himself. That ploy though that it wasn't destroyed in the car crash is shaky but Roddy believed it so it worked. So far so good. 
The suspense as Columbo slowly unseals the box and is opening it while cutting to an increasingly more panicked Roddy McDowell is all well executed, nice quick editing, but then Roddy starts laughing maniacally once he realizes he's just shown his hand. I think a more subdued realization of his fate would have worked so much better, but no, he had to buck for an Emmy and go full wild man while Peter Falk and William Wyndham look on, probably a little embarrassed at what was happening in front of them. And I'm not sure his panic at the sight of a cigar box would hold up in court all that well. It was a good idea that was sabotaged by a bad performance. Two out of five. And Peter Falk, well, he does what he can when saddled with a co-star that is not up to the usual high standard of this show. Columbo's fear of heights rears its head in that first cable car scene. That scene was ultimately a little pointless, just there to set up the location for the final confrontation. But it is Peter Falk that salvages an episode that was my least favorite of the season. Spoiler alert, we're not at the final ranking yet, so he is awarded with another 5 out of 5. There's just one more thing. The season finale, Blueprint for Murder, directed by Peter Falk. Now this is more like it. Patrick O'Neill plays an architect who has grand plans for a development that was supposed to be financed by a Texas millionaire. When said Texas millionaire tells him to think again, he gets murdered. Patrick O'Neill is one of those actors that I know I've seen in plenty of TV shows for sure, but I couldn't quite place him while watching. Early in the episode, he feels like a bit more of a boring villain, and I wasn't sure what to think of him. But as we move along and get further into the story, he becomes a very formidable foe for Columbo. He's again, like the greatest of them, supremely arrogant about his chances of getting away with his crime. And in some scenes later on, especially the one where he gets a flat tire and is stopped by a helpful motorcycle cop, he's able to bring out the tension and nervousness of this character perfectly. Patrick O'Neill gets four out of five. The surrounding cast are uniformly excellent this time, for the most part. Forrest Tucker has a small role as that Texan who gets bumped off, and he was ideal casting. Here's this big guy in a massive cowboy hat, western suits with lots of piping and arrows, and he plays him quite broadly, which is what you need. You need a character to leap off the screen as this larger-than-life figure who flies off the handle at a moment's notice. I loved it. Janice Page was simply great as the ex-wife character who speaks her mind quite bluntly and finds a friend in Lieutenant Columbo. Pamela Austin plays the new, younger wife and was fine, but is pretty much blown off the screen whenever she's stacked up against Janice Page. This ensemble gets four out of five. The murder is hard to categorize on its own because for the first time, we pretty much see nothing. Patrick O'Neill pops up in the back seat of Forrest Tucker's car and then leads him away, and that's all we see. That choice is interesting and changes up the usual Columbo formula, so I'll just say four out of five and dive straight into the last act. Again, straying from what came before, there isn't just one scene that results in a final clue that sends the killer off to the big house. The entire last act serves as a nerve-jangling, suspenseful set piece where we fear Columbo may have met his match. May have. Key part of that sentence. Because this whole time, the killer has been holding onto the body, but the feeling I got when I saw the killer's car pulling onto the construction site was one of such excitement because I knew Columbo was going to emerge from the shadows. But instead, spotlights come on and the murderer is trapped with a dead body half pulled out of the trunk of his car. Maybe one of the best and most satisfying finales, besides suitable for framing, of course. And there's no denying the strength of that case. This architect is going to be doing some serious time. Five out of five. Peter Falk, as I said, directed this episode, which surprised me. Normally, series stars take a crack at directing an episode of their own show three or four seasons in. But he got in there and took the reins already, and does so in such an exceptional and interesting way. That's something I often find with actors directing their own show. They've been there for every episode, seen other directors come and go, so they know the mechanics of their series better than anyone, except maybe the showrunner. So they'll often take what could be a standard plot and film it a little differently, change up the pacing, aim for a different tone or feel to their episode, and we have that here. I'm sure Peter Falk can't take all the credit, the writer would be responsible as well, but the direction of certain scenes is incredible. The scene where they're digging up the concrete pile to check for the dead body is so tense and is made up of quick cuts between Columbo, Patrick O'Neill, Janice Page, the construction workers, the concrete being jackhammered away, and everybody is mopping sweat. And so is the audience. The whole idea of the killer so methodically leading Columbo to suspect that is where the body is hidden was ingenious. For some other changes of pace, we get all the scenes at the city office where Columbo is trying to obtain a permit to authorize removing a concrete pile. He's forced to stand in numerous long lineups, and the exasperation on his face is palpable. 
It's all very funny, but also turns Columbo into an even more endearing and sympathetic character, because you feel bad at what he has to go through to follow through on his hunch. And the scene at the doctor's office, which leads him to try to kick his cigar habit, is a great comedic beat as well. Peter Falk deserves 5 out of 5 on both the acting and directing sides. Alright, the results have been tallied, and the final definitive ranking of Columbo Season 1, from worst to best, is as follows. In last place, Short Fuse with 12 out of 25. No surprises there. Dead Weight is next with 14 out of 25. The pacing on Dead Weight did feel slower than most of the others this season, and the writing was just a bit below par in my opinion. Ransom for a Dead Man comes in with 18 out of 25. And something I just wanted to note, both It and Prescription Murder were a little over an hour and a half in length, probably two hours less commercials now. Which for Prescription Murder works pretty well, but with Ransom for a Dead Man it just felt a bit too long and padded out. Thankfully the rest are all just 75 minutes, which I think is the ideal length for a Columbo episode. Lady in Waiting has a respectable 19 out of 25. Whew, the suspense is building. Can you feel it? Coming in fourth with 20 out of 25 is... Death Lends a Hand. Whoa! Whoa, we have a tie. Murder by the Book and Blueprint for Murder both finish with 22 out of 25. It was a tough call, and Murder by the Book could have edged it out if it weren't for the solution being dependent on a scrap of paper. It was a good race, both performed admirably. And now, the greatest episode of Columbo Season 1 coming in with a stunning 24 out of 25, is suitable for framing. And there you have it. Every episode from the television season that had every child in America asking for a trench coat for Christmas ranked for posterity. Seriously though, overall this season is hugely entertaining and I wholeheartedly recommend it. Although if you're watching this video, you've probably already seen it. I cannot wait to watch season two. Thanks so much for watching this ranking video. If your favorite episode ended up farther down the list than you'd like, I apologize, but my hands are clean. Adios for now.